Change begins from within. As easy as it is to look outside of ourselves and want the world to change, the truth is, it never will if we remain the same. This podcast was created for change makers like you who want more love and connection in your community. Today, you are going to hear stories that will inspire you and also challenge you to be the change. We are going to go deep, my friend. So take a deep breath and settle in. My name is Emilia Tamburini. Welcome to the Circle of Change. Hi, friend. I'm so glad you're here with me today. I truly do feel connected to you. And I hope you can really feel that. In in so many ways, I do see you sitting in circle with me. And it's just very meaningful to have you here taking in these stories, these words, and then sharing with me your own thoughts or just having space and time for you to also reflect on these words. It means a lot. This community means a lot. I have been thinking a lot about the conversation with Sunny and Maynard from our last episode, our last circle. And there were so many poignant sentences, concepts, ways of thinking that have really stuck with me. And they've trickled into so many experiences that I've had in just one week. Like in one week, I facilitated a dialogue on inclusion and diversity in a community that I really love, My one of my entrepreneurial communities. I just started planning another dialogue on reconciliation with a group of facilitators and how it is we bring that to life in the work that we do. And then, of course, I've had my community projects, which are focused on and centered in this working in two worlds approach with indigenous communities and then government and non-government organizations that are not indigenous. And so much of what Sunny and Maynard said just really came to light for me in new and beautiful ways. So I am still very grateful for that conversation and I know I will continue to be but I, I, in this episode, I just wanted to bring a couple of thoughts forward and also see what your thoughts are, what you've been reflecting on. To start, I want to just put some attention on this word indigenous that I keep using, and I used it a lot in the last episode. For me and my brain, indigenous refers to the broad groups of First Nation, Métis, and Inuit populations in Canada. And I know that when I use the word Indigenous, it really is that pan-Indian approach that Sunny spoke of in our, in our circle dialogue. And that they, it misses out on so much uniqueness and beauty and intricacy of all the, the communities and nations and the cultures. And I'm, I'm just very cognizant of that, of course. And I don't have a better word at this moment. And I'm going to keep my ears open to hearing perspectives and and ways of, of communicating. I think for some people, this concept is hard to wrap our heads around because especially I'm I'm thinking people like white people that live in North America that, and that have maybe never traveled um, to other places. For me, this concept, you know, has made a lot of sense over the, over the years of working within um, native and indigenous communities across North America and overseas. And I think a way that I can, speak to it in a way that might be relatable is, you know, when I go to Italy, like, for example, just think of any, 
any community anywhere else in the world. Italy comes to mind because, well, it's part of my heritage and I've been there a number of times and I'm learning Italian right now. So it's on my brain. And so if you go to Italy, you know, every region you go to has a different dialect. So different language. They have different food specialties. They have different festivals, different um, ceramics. They have different um, building structures and ways of celebrating and artwork. Like all these things are so unique to each village and people are passionate about the differences, right? And it's the same thing in our indigenous communities, And I think it's hard sometimes for us white people who grew up here or anybody that grew up here in North America and didn't really get to experience our ancestors that also lived in those sorts of environments. Like for me, my ancestors are all overseas and, you know, I don't understand or have never experienced the different regions of Germany. And I know Italy a bit deeper than that, but this is not unique to your indigenous community. And it's just something that really strikes me and how, you know, how much more respectful we can be if we really truly honor those differences and don't make assumptions before we walk into communities and assume the artwork over here, it would be respectful for the artwork here or the ceremonies here and there. And just really walking in with curiosity and asking questions and learning before we even arrive. I think these are just really important qualities, just like we would do if we were traveling overseas or just like I would do, I would say, if I travel overseas. So I'm going to start there. The first other, like the first point that I really wanted to speak to though, was this concept of time and time is one of the biggest points of tension I find in the current work that I do when I'm working with indigenous and non-indigenous communities that often we have uh, government structures or bodies or corporations that come in with a specific timeline. They have an outcome that they need. And then we kind of work backwards and just sort of uh, construct the project to get ourselves to that timeline at the time that they need. And then we continue to run all of our meetings and all of our activities based on this timeline. And when we get off the timeline, there's a lot of tension that rises and we try to just get back onto the timeline. So in these cases, there is that tension that is there. Rarely do I find that we stop in those moments and really pause and ask, why is this timeline so important? Who is this agenda serving? Who is it benefiting? And what harm is it creating if we just keep plowing forward? I think ultimately, when we show up in these ways, which are just our ways of being that are so ingrained in us. And I'm speaking as a white person who has been part of the dominant culture. When we do this, it really prevents us sometimes from making the huge quantum leaps that are required to make real change, to make policy decisions that really address core needs versus band-aid solutions. And we know band-aid solutions are so much more costly in the end, and also so much more harmful in the end. And so what is another way that we could be, that we could address this concept of time in a way that does not lead to those things? What if we were able to walk into a meeting and be very clear on the intention, and we came equipped with a really good set of questions and created a safe space, And then we just saw what happened. And there needs to be other sort of little things in place to make sure that that runs smoothly and safely. But that's what we did. There was no desire to get to a certain point by the end of the meeting. This meeting didn't have to lead to the next meeting. That we just waited to see what what were the outcomes? What were the teachings? We reflected on them and then collectively decided on, okay, what is the next best step? So this is a really step by step approach versus a mechanized approach. I think ultimately this whole concept of time and having agendas and sticking to them is a 
way of expressing control. It's a reflection of our collective uncomfortableness with uncertainty. And I think if we do really want to get to a different place that we we need to kind of get squiggly with that, get uncomfortable and try to really ask these questions. So one, one question that I've been asking myself a lot when I feel this tension arise is, okay, if we remove this pressure of a timeline, what would we be doing right now? If this timeline wasn't here, what would this project call for in this moment right now? That might be a question that you want to play around with in the projects that you are in, where this is coming up for you. The second piece that I want to touch into is this whole concept of taking pauses. And of course, this relates to what I was just speaking of. But in our dialogue with Maynard and Sunny, Maynard said this thing, and he repeated it a couple of times, and I'm going to repeat it again because I just love it so much. He said something to the effect of, you know, when you, when you encounter these things, when you read these things, don't flip to the sports page. And I think what he was saying there is just be with that for a second, take it in, put yourself in somebody else's shoes in that moment and feel what that's like. But so often we don't do that because we are so uncomfortable with what would happen if we did feel. Again, that's a bit of the uncertainty piece, but it also speaks to our relationship with emotions in general. You know, we, we start to feel uncomfortable and we, we run, we bolt, and we do that in so many different ways. We get angry and we project, we avoid by all sorts of behaviors, binge watching TV, overeating, indulging in substances, talking nonstop. There's so many ways we're very creative beings that we engage in avoiding our feelings. And it's really become sort of a survival mechanism for us. But we know by now that that way of being in the world actually causes harm. And so to be a different way, to not just flip to the sports page, we have to get more comfortable with being in the uncomfortableness, you know, and that, that requires certain skill sets. It requires uh, emotional intelligence. It requires us to really conceptualize emotion in a different way, the way it was intended to be as a guidance system and nothing more than that. And to ground ourselves into a deeper way of understanding about why this is so important for us to open ourselves up with imagination to the possibilities of what might our world look like if we just stopped avoiding all the uncomfortable emotions and we were just able to be, to be with the truth, to process it and to figure out what to do after that. And it was so interesting Maynard said this, and then I was in a bookstore a week later, and we pre-recorded, so this was a little bit ago. I was in a bookstore, and this woman was in there buying a newspaper. And the person selling her the newspaper said, oh, just to warn you, the first five pages are all about the children being found at the Kamloops Residential School, buried. The response was, oh, thank you so much for letting me know. I'll just skip right to the section I need. And there it is. That's exactly what Maynard said. Don't flip to the sports page. Well, that's exactly what was being reenacted right there. And it just really indicates, again, that that discomfort we have. And I speak to this with experience. I speak to this with a lifetime of avoiding emotions, ignoring them, and running from them. And when I woke up and realized that all that did was lead to harm, to pain, and then eventually illness, it motivated me to do something different about it. And the result of that has been transformational. Like I do not recognize myself or my life from even five years ago. And when we all go through this collectively, everybody benefits, all people and our earth. So it's so worth it. So again, just something to consider is how can you get more comfortable with those uncomfortable feelings, those uncomfortable emotions that come up 
And can you just start to raise your awareness of when you might be avoiding? What are your avoidance patterns? We all have them. The third thing I want to touch on, and then I'll leave it at this, is the whole concept of walking on two legs that Sunny brought up. I absolutely love the way she spoke about this because it's so tangible. It's so graspable. Essentially what she said, and you can please and please just go listen to her words in our last episode. But the whole concept was that, you know, that one muscle, the Western muscle, the Western way of seeing the world, it's so built up and so strong right now. And I would also argue that that's the, the, the same, the truth for masculine ways of being in the world, that our masculine ways of being, the Western way of approaching life and policy and how we show up, those muscles are so strong. But the muscles that represent indigenous ways of knowing and being and governing and also our feminine ways of being and knowing and governing, they're very underdeveloped because they have been suppressed, put in a corner, and essentially told to shut up. But those muscles that represent our indigenous ways of being and our feminine ways of being are so underdeveloped. And that's a huge problem. This is simply a fact of where we stand today and how we are standing. It's actually a really great visual if we think about it as walking on two legs where we've got this super muscular built up leg and we have this super skinny underdeveloped leg. And what does that mean? Like, just think about it in that analogy. I mean, we're walking really funny right now. We don't look very healthy. We're kind of limping around. And when we do that for an extended period of time, I know this as a kinesiologist, and I know this from observing many people and myself being injured, that when we do that, our hip gets put out of place, and then our knee goes out, and then our back is screwed up, and then we're spending like our whole life repairing, having surgery, and then healing from that. And it's the exact same thing, except the consequences are so much graver. Addiction and poverty and climate change and lives being taken, not to mention how suppressed our economy is. And I'm going to touch on that a little bit later, but looking at it through this lens of walking on two legs, I think is really brilliant because then we can maybe start to think about solutions in terms of, okay, well, how do we build that muscle up? Can we conceptualize our decolonizing process as a way to build that, the, that other muscle up that has been so underdeveloped? And so, I don't know, I'm going to put some thoughts forward to work with this analogy. So I think first of all, if we're going to start building up muscle, we really need to learn effective ways to train. We also need to get real about the state of things like, okay, well, what does this really look like? What, what does it really mean? What does it feel like? And then once we get there, we, we can start training. Maybe we found a trainer, we found some support, and we can start to read and listen and learn and find safe spaces to explore this is us finding a gym and a trainer. And when we start training, it's important that we go at our own pace. You know, I think so often we get wrapped up into what everybody else is doing and where I should be and, and listening to what others are telling us about what to do. But for those of you who are, you know, body aware and have gone through your own training processes, you know that you have to do it in a way that is right for you at your pace. And so I think that's just a great analogy learning for all of us to take into this process of decolonizing and then the third concept that is so relevant to building muscle is that there is pain in growth. There is pain in growth. You know, if you've ever gone to a gym and I avoid lifting weights for the most part, it's not something that I really enjoy, although I know it's something I should do. Um, but the, the times that I have done it, you know, I go into the gym, I lift some weights and like the day after, but especially the day after that, I'm in pain. I'm sore. I can barely brush my teeth. But from a kinesiologist perspective, I know that I'm in pain because there are so many micro tears going on in my muscle. But when those micro tears heal, my muscle is so much stronger and it's bigger. 
So the pain is required. And so that's probably a good indication for us to know that if we're, if we're doing this well, if we're doing it effectively, if we're not going through periods of being uncomfortable, then we're probably not really learning. We're probably still in that comfort zone that is probably representing a colonial way of being. You know, we have so many blinders about this, and I'm continuing to learn this more and more and more. And it's not going to be fun all the time. It's not going to be comfortable all the time. But it's so important to get to the vision, get the vision board in place, put the picture of the super muscular person in front of you to see what you are headed toward. And when we speak of this in the in in lifting up feminine ways of being and lifting up indigenous ways of being, you know, we I don't even think there is a vision board that is possible to represent the beauty and the possibility that will exist. You know, you think about just the economy alone. And Maynard spoke to this a little bit in terms of, you know, what will happen when indigenous communities and people are actually able to effectively participate in the economy because up until now that hasn't even been like an option because of our, the Indian act essentially because of this policy that still exists in Canada. But Oh my goodness, when that indigenous and feminine muscle is fully developed, you know, your mind is going to be blown. If you thought we've had a strong economy at some point in our history I think we have zero idea right now the amount of abundance and beauty that is going to exist when these individuals, these cultures are healthy and in a beautiful position of strength and leadership. We have no idea, but it is gorgeous. (laughs) It is absolutely gorgeous gorgeous. And I know that in all of my being, I think that when we collectively let all birds fly freely, that we are all going to be lifted up beyond the horizon and get to see this thing that is breathtaking, that is beautiful beyond anything beautiful that we've ever seen before. I know that to be true in my heart. So that's where we're headed. That's why all of this work, this pain, this uncomfortableness is worth it. And I know that you too have to find your own reason. And I think this will continue to come as we keep exploring and diving into these topics and uncovering together. So please stay here, stay with me, stay in this circle, and let's see where we can go one step at a time, one conversation at a time. I'm now passing the talking piece to you. If you feel called to put your voice in the circle, please head to humconsulting.ca forward slash podcast and share your story there. I cannot wait to hear what has come up for you as you have listened to what has been shared here today. I wish you love and joy beyond your wildest imagination. Thank you so much for being here in the circle of change. I also want to express my gratitude to the following peeps. Circle of Change is recorded on Lekwungen territories, and I am so grateful to live on this land. Our opening and closing music was created by the talented E-Roll Beats. You can find his creations at erollbeats.com. And special thanks to my coach, Mary Chan of Organized Sound Productions for bringing this podcast to life. Until next time, ciao.